So the Hebrew word for flattery is chanifa. And in our literature, it has many shades of meaning and form ranging from severe sin to situations where it is actually tolerated. The term actually appears in the Torah in a very unusual context. In the book of Numbers, chapter 35, at the end of that chapter, the Torah speaks about the need to make sure that we punish people who are murderers in the land of Israel. And the Torah says in verses 31 to 34, you shall not accept ransom for the life of a murderer who is worthy of capital punishment, for he shall surely be put to death. You shall not pollute the land in which you are, for the blood will pollute the land. The land will not have atonement for the blood that was spilled in it except through the blood of the one who spilled it. Now the truth is that our sages tell us that it was virtually impossible to administer the death penalty. Uh, The laws of testimony were so strict that it was virtually impossible to secure a, a sentence of capital punishment. But the Torah here is telling us that there are people who certainly deserve capital punishment, and we have to punish them. And so even in cases where we don't execute a murderer, the court is certainly allowed to punish them. For example, with imprisonment, you can throw them into prison for life. The Torah here is telling us we cannot allow people that are guilty of a capital crime, murderers, to go free, to go without being punished. Now, the word used here in this portion of the Bible for pollute, the the scripture here said that if you allow the murderer to go free, you'll pollute the land. The word used here literally means to flatter. The word to flatter. Now, where there were other Hebrew words that could have been used to convey the meaning of to pollute the land or to bring guilt upon the land, there were several other Hebrew words that could have been used. So why did the Torah use the word for flattery? Sort of a strange usage. So Nachmanides, the Ramban, wrote that don't flatter the land means the following. He says it means don't make the land into a hypocrite. Flattery is often a form of hypocrisy when you don't really mean what you say. And so Nachmanides says that the land of Israel is supposed to produce abundant fruit and produce. That's the promise that God made to us. But God also promised in Deuteronomy chapter 28 that if we pollute the land by not carrying out justice, the land will not produce for us. The land will not produce what it promised us. And so if we don't carry out justice, By punishing murderers, we will turn the land into a flattering hypocrite. Another medieval commentary, the Chizkuni, understands the phrase don't pollute the land as don't flatter the murderers who dwell in the land. Again, the literal word is not pollute, it's flatter. And he says don't flatter the land really should be read as Don't flatter the murderers who inhabit the land. And the broader context here is that we must not flatter wrongdoers in general. And this is how the Sifri, a Talmudic commentary, understands this verse in the book of Numbers. The Sifri says that Hanifa is false flattery of any wrong behavior. Anytime we condone negative behavior, we are guilty of flattery. Now the Talmud in Tractate Sota, page 41, gives an example of this. We know that every seven years there was a commandment of Hakel, where the entire Jewish nation gathered in Jerusalem, in the Holy Temple, on the holiday of Sukkot, following the sabbatical year. And during this ceremony of Hakel, the king is supposed to read the book of Deuteronomy to the nation. So the Talmud in this tractate Sota describes what happened when King Agrippas 
read the Torah in the year 41 of the Common Era. Now, Agrippus was really technically disqualified from being king because of his lineage. He had issues with his lineage, but somehow he became king anyway. And he was someone who did have a tremendous amount of respect for the Torah and for Jewish law, and he was actually respected as a person that was very humble and modest. And so when he was reading from the Torah, he stood, even though the king is allowed to sit. However, when he came to the verse in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17, which says you may not place over yourselves a foreign person to be king over you, the Talmud says that his eyes began to flow with tears. The people saw this, and they cried out to him, Do not fear, Agrippa. You are our brother. The Talmud has Rabbi Nussan teaching that at that moment, the nation of Israel became liable for destruction because they flattered Agrippa, meaning they shouldn't have given him the impression that his lineage was fine and there was no problem with him being king. And one of the great problems with this kind of flattery is that when you condone, condone wrongful behavior, you're misrepresenting the Torah. You're giving the impression that the Torah does not forbid what it actually does forbid. Our literature has different levels of Hanifa, of this kind of flattery. Rabbeinu Yonah, in his Sharei Tshuva, describes nine different levels of Hanifa. Here are some of them. The worst is telling someone that the sin they have done is okay, it's acceptable. Then, the next level down is praising or honoring a sinful person publicly without necessarily telling them that what they did was okay. Meaning, that you don't point out that their sinful act was okay, but you publicly praise them as a great person. The third level down is praising the wrongdoer in private, meaning you're not publicly praising them, but privately you praise them as a great person. That's also flattering them. Number four, not that you ever praise the person, but you fail to offer reproof when you could have, meaning you don't say anything positive about them. But if someone does something wrong and you don't say anything to tell them that they're wrong, you, didn't, you don't reprove them, that's a problem. Now this actually is complicated because our sages teach us that if you know that someone won't listen, it's better not to say anything. And that before we ever give reproof, we need to first build rapport and trust. So the idea of giving reproof is a not necessarily an easy thing to do. But if we are able to give reproof, if we're able to correct someone and we don't, that's a form of flattery. Number five, remaining present when wrongdoing is taking place, meaning in a situation when it may not have been possible to give reproof. For example, if you're with a group of people and someone is speaking Lashon Hara, is speaking slander or libel, is speaking slander about other people. So normally you're supposed to tell someone that's slander. You can't speak like that. But again, it may be a case when you're not able to give them reproof. Maybe they won't listen. But if you stay there in the room with them and you don't leave, that's also considered a form of flattery, meaning remaining present when wrongdoing is taking place in a situation where you're not able to correct people. Number six is treating a evil person with respect in some way, just showing them respect. So you're not flattering them and telling them they're a great person, but you treat them with respect. You might, for example, stand up when they walk into the room. Another example, a little bit lower down, is when a respected person, out of self-interest, appoints someone not fully qualified to a position of leadership or to be in a rabbinic position, that's considered a form of flattery. Now, the problem with Hanifa, with flattery, is number one, it hinders the person that's doing wrong from repenting. Meaning, if you give them the impression that what they're doing is fine, then you're putting a roadblock in the path of their tshuva, of their repentance. Number two, by not correcting people and by 
by even doing worse, by praising someone who's an evildoer, you encourage others to emulate that bad behavior. Number three, if you praise someone who's doing wrong, it's a desecration of God's name. Because what you're demonstrating is you're more concerned with offending the evildoer than offending God. Number four, by, as I said before, when you praise a wicked person, you are distorting the Torah. You're giving the impression that the Torah accepts certain behavior that it doesn't really accept. And number five, what happens with flattery is that you neglect your obligation of giving tochacha, of giving reproof. Now, we move from here to the more common understanding of flattery, which is essentially insincere compliments in order to get something from someone else, meaning out of self-interest, you compliment someone else. An example, it sounds innocent, but let's imagine someone invited you for a Shabbat lunch in July. Now, you don't particularly enjoy their company, but you feel an obligation to pay them back, to reciprocate. You happen to know that in August they're going to be out of town. And so you go over and you say you'd like to have them for Shabbat dinner in August. So here you're trying to create the impression that you really would love their company, when in fact you wouldn't. That's considered insincere and misleading. It's a form of hypocrisy and flattery. However, if it's not self-serving, if it's for another person's benefit, flattery is okay. Meaning it's only considered objectionable if you're being insincere out of self-interest. Meaning that you want to get something out of someone. But if you're trying to help someone else, or you're trying to benefit a relationship, flattery is okay. So for example, let's say someone gives a speech you're allowed to compliment them and even slightly exaggerate what you thought about the speech in order to make them feel good and in order to encourage them in their future speech making. Now, if your motivation is that you're going to compliment them because you want to receive a favor from them, that's prohibited. Similarly, it's okay for a teacher to flatter a student in order to build their self-confidence, in order to encourage them to study, that's perfectly legitimate. The teacher can talk about what a great question they asked or what a great homework assignment they handed in, even though it may not have been that great. But the teacher is allowed to flatter the student in order to encourage them. And certainly in a husband-wife relationship, it's perfectly okay for a husband to flatter his wife in order to build the love and connection and shalom bayit between them. So we see that flattery is a diverse concept ranging from totally evil behavior where we literally praise wickedness to forms of flattery that are totally okay for positive reasons.